We often say we reside on a small pale blue dot, and indeed most of our planet is covered in oceans. But there is land down there, buried so deep under the water no light ever reaches it, yet we might come to dwell there one day. Today we will be continuing our look at the oceans. This is part 2 of our thought experiment begun in seasteading and artificial islands. So while you don't have to have seen that first, I would recommend watching it before continuing. The ocean depths fascinate us and are still largely unexplored, as alien in many ways as other planets, and hosting some life in greater depths that looks quite alien. Mankind has been traveling the seas as long as we've history to record it, but until the last century we couldn't go very deep, just brush the surface. Humanity has often imagined living in domed cities on the seafloor, and we'll be looking at how you could do that today, but we'll also be exploring many other options for utilizing the deep sea, and even discuss how we might make artificial volcanoes to make islands. However, we have to start by acknowledging one key point. A big glass dome on the seafloor under a kilometer of ocean is not a place most folks would want to live or even visit. Even ignoring that you're protected from the water by a glass dome under a hundred atmospheres of pressure, there's nothing to see. There's no night darker than the oceans once you're a kilometer deep, sunlight just cannot penetrate down there. If you want to live down there and see some creatures or the seafloor, you need to have external lights and in doing that you will attract things that can use light to live, which means your dome will probably get covered in algae and scum and not be too fun to look through. And again, there's that pressure issue. This isn't like space where the atmosphere difference is 0 and 1, this is 100 to 1, higher than on the surface of Venus. Every square inch of that dome is under 1400 pounds of weight, every square centimeter 100 kilograms. We can build stuff that can handle that, that's about the pressure exerted by someone walking around in stiletto heels, but it's not really something you want to do with a thin transparent dome, so the glass dome concept for underwater bases is more likely to be a bunker structure set into the sea floor that has windows in rooms that are compartmentalized against flooding if they break. Now domes are an option closer to the coast where the sea floor isn't as deep, and the light still penetrates, but even then, you're likely to use the bunker with Windows approach, not the big glass dome. That has an appeal on airless worlds for agriculture so you can grow plants, but for the sea that's not necessary as you can just grow the stuff on the surface of the water anyways and save on the dome. Such bunker windows will also need wiper blades like your car has since again they'll get covered in muck quite quickly. Either algae will grow there or it will fall down to lower depths as marine snow, the various organic detritus dropped from higher levels that feeds the midnight ecologies of the bathypelagic and abyssopelagic regions. Thing is, most of the ocean goes a lot deeper than sunlight, or indeed even a kilometer. Most of our planet is ocean and most of that has an average depth of 3 to 4 kilometers. There's parts that are rich in life, as sun and nutrients occur together, but that's the minority. Most of the oceans are a desert. Sure, they have plenty of water, plenty of sun, plenty of nutrients, but in most of the ocean those last two don't mix much with the light above and the nutrients below. Next week we will dive into the environments of space habitats, we'll discuss how the varying gravity will let us grow trees of stupendous heights, And this is one approach to terraforming our own oceans, as we might be able to create sea trees able to grow from the lowest depths all the way up to the surface, to get nutrients from the sea floor and light from the sky, like seaweed does at more modest depths. Such a plant would be hard to engineer or evolve, there's too much distance from light to nutrient or nutrient to light, and would need many tricky features to permit the needed strength, energy, and nutrient movement but it could be possible. For that matter, we will see today there is a ton of geothermal energy down on the seafloor, and an organism could be created to make use of that. One could imagine some massive tree that kept the oxygen it makes in buoyant sacks or inflated leaves to help it handle its mass, 
setting roots in the ocean floor and spreading its leaves across the surface, but we could also build skyscrapers or sea scrapers which might use the same approach, so massive in size they could only be viewed as arcologies, more on that in a bit. But it's worth remembering that bioengineering is on the table, for plants and for people too. Mythology is full of mermaids, and it may be possible to tweak people or our pets to have gills or more modestly to handle pressure changes better if folks really want to live in the seas. There are not too many reasons why folks would move to the deep ocean, unlike living on the top of it, but we did find some, like wanting to be protected from supernova blasts or just be as far from other humans as possible without leaving Earth. We'll go over some of the others as we discuss our options today, but it raises a big point we make in the Outward Bound series that colonizing a planet does not necessarily mean a lot of folks live there. A factory planet churning out megatons of manufactured goods every minute is certainly colonized, but might only have a few thousand folks living there to do maintenance. Similarly, Underwater oceanic colonization offers us a lot of resources and benefits, but not too many for housing. You might retreat there as a refuge from invasion or disaster, or like many colonists in history have been exiled or left specifically to get away from others, but those imply the surface has in some way become hostile to you. One novel example, as an exception to small groups for science or tourism or machine maintenance, is prisons. If you want to build a supermax people can't escape from, even the moon is less secure. Worldwide, a little over 1% of the population is in prison, which probably vastly exceeds the number of folks we'd have engaging in tourism or science under the sea at any given time. I'm not sure the practicality or ethics of such a concept, but it does amusingly fit with our remarks from last time about a lot of early oceanic colonies being founded by those trying to evade laws back on land. You can even give them a diverse mix of oxygen and helium, or hydrogen, oxygen, and helium instead of oxygen and nitrogen, so that if someone did get out they'd be stuck for many hours decompressing somewhere you could grab them. Current mixes and suits still put a fairly shallow limit on diving, but we may improve both. This, by the way, is one of our options for fairly deep habitats that are classic domes. You don't have a pressure differential because you put the dome at the same pressure as the water and change the air mix. Nitrogen becomes a narcotic at higher pressures, it's not just the nitrogen bubble issue for decompression, so you have to remove it for people to operate at pressures deeper than about 60 meters or 6 atmospheres. Incidentally, you add one atmosphere of pressure for every 10 meters of depth. That's Earth's gravity and the density of the material stacking up, and water has a specific gravity of 1, or a density of 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, although salt water is just slightly higher, gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared, and 1.03 is the specific gravity for salt water, conveniently 9.8 times 1.03 equals 10. 10 meters of additional depth adds an atmosphere of pressure in salt water. However, if you're under rock that's twice as dense, it would be every 5 meters, or if you're under air, which is about a thousand times less dense, it's about a kilometer. If you're on Europa, where gravity is only 13.4% of Earth normal, it would be one atmosphere for every 75 meters. That's one of the appeals of setting up undersea habitats on moons with subsurface oceans. Sunlight is a non-issue at that point anyway, and so are natural air mixes, so you can spread out a lot more before water pressure becomes a problem. Oceans are truly huge volumes, you can't really think of them as areas, and we often talk about using hydroponics to help with food needs on Earth or to grow food in space, but we often skip aquaponics or aeroponics as options too. We'll skip aeroponics today as well. But aquaponics is a growing industry, no pun intended, and is ideal for subsurface ocean farming. We think of floating farms, but there are downsides there and one of those is waves. The surface of the sea is choppy, but the further you descend in the ocean, the more that dissipates. As submarines and fishes both show, your options in the sea are not limited to floating on the surface or rooting to the sea floor. 
so you could have farms or cities that just kept themselves slightly submerged, and indeed they could bob around, surfacing when they wanted or dipping a bit deeper if the weather was bad. Even at just 50 meters, so long as you're far from shore, you're pretty safe from even the worst of storms. An aquaponics farm need not stay at a set depth, you could tow them deeper for nights or bad weather, but planting one at that depth still permits a solid amount of light to get in and is still shallow enough that divers could go down without messing with their air mix. Such farms aren't much more than a bunch of nets and rods to hoard some structure, and presumably some ballast to allow it to keep or change depth, so we're not contemplating anything very fancy. Going deeper, you'd have to start supplementing sunlight with artificial light, and that's a power issue. That could easily end up a non-issue in the future, as we get better energy sources like fusion or the power satellites we discussed some months back. But the oceans offer us some power options too. We've discussed some surface options last time, but Deep Down has two of interest to us. First, there's fission. As we improve our reactor designs to better utilize the fuel we put in them, better recycle the materials used in and around them, and access new fuels like thorium, we get access to a vast supply of energy from fissile materials, enough to last us as long as civilization has already been around at least. But people still don't like it in their backyards, and they certainly don't like the waste there. Remote undersea nuclear plants are a handy option in that regard, and water is one of the best shields against radiation. Dumping radioactive waste in the sea is actually banned by international treaty under the London Convention, but mostly relates to some rather contemptible practices at the time, and ocean floor disposal, particularly into subduction zones where the materials will get dragged down into the planet's mantle, hoards some good options for disposal of waste which might not be recyclable and be radioactive for very long periods. Of course it's also a potentially awesome place to find such materials too. Most of Earth is underwater, and the seafloor is a lot closer to the mantle than the continental surfaces are, and not just because the seafloor is deeper. The Moho discontinuity, the boundary between the crust and the mantle, is typically closer under the sea. 20 to 90 kilometers below the surface of the continents, but only about 5 to 10 kilometers beneath the ocean floor. Beyond mineral wealth, that makes it a great place for geothermal power, and as we get better with superconductors, we may well start to move all of our power generation off Earth's lands to the seas and space. Such power lines would be one of many examples of infrastructural networks we might run on or maybe in if we buried them just under the ocean floor. We already lay fiber optic cables that way, and we may do power or pipelines, but we may also do transport. Elon Musk's Hyperloop passenger transport system, love it or hate it, has popularized the notion of vacuum trains, or neo-vacuum trains, but the concept is much older, and I regard it as something of an inevitability. Hypersonic or suborbital flights may be on the table in even the near future, but ultimately you can't have craft moving through the atmosphere over land at such speeds, the sonic booms would be ruinous and that's very fuel intensive. You can set up a transport network using orbital rings, see that episode for details, but those are essentially vacuum trains in space. When flying you accelerate and as you gain altitude the atmosphere thins, letting you speed up with less air resistance. Go high enough and it causes no drag or booms and you can accelerate as fast as you please. However, a vacuum train, or neo-vacuum train like the Hyperloop, on ground or buried under it, offers the same option, and maintaining a vacuum deep underwater is no harder than maintaining one atmosphere of pressure there. Here's the cool thing. Much like a launch loop, when you've no air in the way, you can accelerate as fast as folks can comfortably handle, and even if that was just 1G, you would hit Mach 1 in 35 seconds, and Mach 10 in 6 minutes. Such a mega channel would permit travel from New York to London in half an hour, and you could leave right from a station in the middle of the city. You don't necessarily have to stop accelerating at that speed either. Same as the burn and flip method we discussed with spaceships, a vac train, essentially a spaceship, can potentially accelerate the whole way, flipping halfway through. 
and if folks don't mind a bit more acceleration, or you're sending priority cargo, you are looking at being able to get anywhere on the planet in half an hour or less. But you have to have a track and it has to be pretty straight, beyond the curvature of the Earth. Indeed as we discussed in Orbital Rings, that does impose a maximum velocity because you are turning with the sphere of Earth, and we can cheat and turn upside down, so that the centrifugal force from turning is counteracted by Earth's gravity, and it works as well underground or undersea as in space. You tear through that tube at insane speeds, upside down at 2G, walking around on the ceiling for the trip and in doing so can achieve twice the speed satellites fly over at while still feeling like you're under normal gravitational force, albeit to an outsider upside down. Needless to say, building such a network would not be cheap, but only in the context of normal highways. We've millions of miles of road and track after all, these are harder to build and pricier, but we're getting much better at boring tunnels. Key thing to recall about vacuum trains though isn't just that they could get you across the oceans very quickly, it's that it could get you from Chicago to Detroit in minutes, or Atlanta to Houston, it's not just for globe spanning trips. However, our interest is in those big people pipelines under the sea today, so we'll save discussing huge underground networks of them for later in the series. They're a good way to get your feet wet in deep sea colonization though, because all those vac trains and fiber optic trunk and power and pipelines need maintenance and need outposts along the way for safety reasons. As we said, with any colony operation, whatever the main purpose is, you want secondary industries to help move marginal operations into profitable zones and geothermal power or aquaponics or a fission plant or even an undersea supermax prison are options there. But mining is likely to be a big one, and can maybe get even bigger. We always talk about mining asteroids or moons, but every asteroid and moon in our solar system has less combined mass than Earth and most of that is in the mantle and core, and again the Moho discontinuity, the edge of the mantle, is a lot closer on the seafloors. Trying to mine the mantle, sometimes called Moho mining, is a lot easier said than done, even in the context of mining things millions of kilometers away in space, and we'll discuss it more down the road, but it is theoretically doable, essentially boring a hole down into the magma below. We have materials that can handle those temperatures, and while the pressures involved make that much harder, it's not impossible. Let's imagine for the moment though, we took such a material and made it a big straw, with one end poking down into the mantle and the other all the way up to the surface, and let it fill with air, not water. Straw is an apt analogy as you now have a huge pressure differential and magma can rise up. We might refine this, extracting what materials we want, and dump the spill around our lava straw, building an artificial island in the process. Indeed we might use such an approach along with good earthquake modeling to relieve the pressures that cause earthquakes, volcanic eruptions where we don't want them, and so on. These, especially as uncontrolled events, are not your friend when engaging in massive planetary engineering projects. Needless to say the mineral wealth and the raw power available by steam turbines using this heat might make for major industries too. But the ocean floor alone offers a lot of mineral wealth, and we mentioned an idea last time of a jellyfish habitat, where most folks live in a main facility on or near the ocean surface while long tentacles scrape the seafloor for minerals and nutrients and move the place around or anchored it. We talked about lighting those tentacles to provide for ecosystems it might haul along with it, but you need not necessarily move such a thing either. We said near the beginning that you wouldn't want to live under the sea very deep because there's nothing to see unless you light it, and we just discussed a straw many kilometers long buried in the mantle and reaching to the surface which could become a habitat of its own, much like oil rigs. Let us instead imagine a skyscraper built on the ocean floor and all the way up into the skies. You could put windows on such a thing so long as you compartmentalize every section against flooding if one shadows, and indeed all the air, surrounded by water, provides a strong buoyant force that would relieve a lot of the weight and compression normal skyscrapers face, letting you get away with a thicker skin. 
One could give it tendrils too, just cords floating out from one side, giving some light and attracting and boosting the local ecology. So now you can see it, and there's plenty to see, and it provides some food for those living inside. This is very like the arcology notion we've often discussed, vast buildings in which whole cities live and farm their own food, vertical farming and mega skyscrapers essentially, and like many such structures, it benefits from being bigger. We said in the arcologies episode that you'd generally make them wide and use the middle for farming and manufacturing, folks would live on the outer edge with a better view. Depending on how safe those windows are and how good the view is, you might reverse that in deeper waters, or stick to it, but you could have vast columns or cones of arcologies rising up from the middle of the oceans, and not just the surface either, but far above. Indeed, if we get good enough with our materials or active support systems we've discussed before, these could be space towers too. One might imagine Earth in a few centuries sporting mega arcologies that rooted themselves all the way down to the mantle and all the way up to space, from Moho discontinuity to Kalman Line. Such a structure would have, by normal building standards, about 40,000 floors, and a big cone or needle-shaped one, just 10 kilometers in radius, quite small for an island, would have an internal floor space equivalent to a small continent, and one could build tens of thousands of such structures, each housing billions in comfort. As we mentioned in the Ecumenopolis episode, Planet-Wide Cities, the follow-up on all colleges, finding room for trillions of people on Earth, if you have the energy, doesn't involve paving over everything, indeed you'd be enhancing and empowering local ecosystems if done properly. The problem is getting rid of all the heat. Far future stuff, but that's what we look at here, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention one other approach to colonizing the oceans, which would be to drain them. We have a lot of water, indeed we have a lot in the mantle too, not just the oceans, and it's precious stuff in space, but arguably mostly in the way down here. Almost all the ecology happens in the first hundred meters or so, as does the evaporation that fuels our rain supply and weather systems. Last time we mentioned a scenario in which we might start building many skinny and long islands across the oceans and even cutting canals into the continents. You can do the reverse too, drain those seas out and cut deep lakes and smaller seas as cisterns while making new land on what used to be the ocean floor, and moving much of that water into habitats built in orbit around Earth. One need not go all in on this either. Water levels have been much lower in the past, that's how our ancestors could walk to the Americas or Australia, and one might decide to restore that, leaving a very different looking planet. Again such things are why we call this the Earth 2.0 series, as they fundamentally change the planet, whether for better or worse is an ethics question we'll skip here, though certainly a worthy one for contemplation, for the series will just lay out the options that might be on the table and where they might not be something we want to do on Earth, the galaxy is full of other worlds we might employ such techniques on. Or in our daydreams too. As I said at the beginning, the ocean depths fascinate us and are still largely unexplored alien places. Mankind has been traveling the seas as long as we've history to record it, but until the last century we couldn't go very deep, just brush the surface. We often talk about the golden age of science fiction and the classics written in the middle of the 20th century, but it goes back before then and one of the true classics is Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, our book of the month. It chronicles a trip around and under the oceans in the submarine Nautilus, appropriately sharing a name with the actual Nautilus, a craft built in 1800 that's usually considered the first practical submarine, indeed it was also the name of the first nuclear-powered submarine, which also first transited under the North Pole in 1958. Verne's Nautilus, which he chronicled the voyages of 150 years ago, sets out in the 1860s for a trip around the world. Initially, our narrator for the tale joins an expedition hunting the Nautilus, thinking that a sea monster, not a submarine making a long journey. The commander for this 20,000 league journey is Captain Nemo, a fascinating character that also appears in another of Vaughn's novels, The Mysterious Island, 
and has shown up in many of the tribute works to Vaughn, like the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Needless to say, this story has been adapted to film and TV many times, both good and bad, but the book is still amazing even now. It's dated a bit in its science and technology, needless to say, however that's not only part of its charm but also a plus. It is so easy for us to forget that science and technology and the drive for contemplating the future is not something new and that we had already accomplished so much by the mid-19th century. While hardly without their faults, there is so much to admire about our ancestors and such works let you immerse yourself in the world as they saw it and the future as they saw it, what they got right and what they got wrong, always something to keep in mind as we ponder our future here on this channel. There are many audio adaptations and performances to pick from, and if you'd like to grab a free copy of the audiobook from Audible, you can listen to a sample of each first and find the narrator whose voice you like the most. I think I saw a dozen or more to pick from, and I noticed one was done by Harlan Ellison, that fantastic and flamboyant author who sadly left us a few months back. I had a chance to attend a talk by him many years ago, and he's always a pleasure to listen to, and he narrated quite a few audiobooks. Another thing I like about Audible, if you find a narrator you like, you can easily pull up other stories they've read, and it's often a good way to find new authors you enjoy too. If you'd like to grab a free copy of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by whichever narrator you enjoy, just use my link in this episode's description, audible.com slash Isaac, or text Isaac to 500500 to get a free book and a 30 day free trial, and that book is yours to keep whether you stay on with Audible or not. Next week we'll be back up in space in Environments of Space Habitats. We'll discuss O'Neill Sondors and other space habitats, focusing on their environments, ecology, and weather, which we'll see is not just inside, but also outside in the not quite void of space. And two weeks from now we'll be teaming up with the SENS Research Foundation to discuss extending the human lifespan, a topic we've discussed before here in terms of its implications for civilization, but this time we'll dig deeper into the biology of aging and the science of how to slow it down, way down. For alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the notifications bell, and if you enjoyed this episode hit the like button and share it with others. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.